of the Dutch Central Bank and member of the governing council of the European Central Bank. He has uh, an integral understanding of the challenges the Eurozone faces. At the peak of the crisis, Mario Draghi asserted that the ECB will do whatever it takes to save the Euro. The strategy seems to have paid off. The discussion of Euro countries leaving the Eurozone has wandered off into the past. And there's a positive, optimist view sweeping the Euro, uh, European Union. Growth and inflation are back. This positive attitude, together with the uh, monetary actions of the ECB, have given our leaders the chance to uh, define a sustainable and durable architecture for the European project. But can we really trust our politicians to build a safe home with strong foundations? Or will Europe of be forged in crisis, as Jean Monnet, father of European integration, predicted, forcing politicians to once again improvise in the midst of uncertainty? Throughout the interview, there are possibilities to ask questions. Uh, Valentina is holding the audience mic. She will rush her way uh, if you uh, raise your hand and once the opportunity presents itself. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Klaas Kanot. You want me to sit yeah, here? please here. Okay. Welcome. Great. Oh, welcome back. Yeah. Um, over the past seven years, you've been able to define yourself uh, within the European Central Bank community. Um, you're often described to the media as a hawk. What makes them say that? Ooh, um, <laughs> well, you're asking me what the media writes. Uh, you should actually ask the media, I guess. But <laughs> now, normally, uh, there's a, this distinction between doves and hawks, which makes sort of the debate on huh, how tight or how easy monetary policy should be a little bit more lively. In general, I would say that hawks are a bit more concerned about inflation and doves are a bit more concerned about growth risks. Um, but at the same time, I must say, having been in the council for seven years, this is clearly not a static sort of situation. Uh, when economic conditions change, you change your mind. I mean, it's John Maynard Keynes, right, who said, when the facts change, I change my mind. And that, I think, is something that every economist should, uh, should take to heart. So that's why I'm not so overly keen on this, uh, on this, on this classification to begin with. Uh, but it is easier to... Uh, represent uh, central bankers in those terms between hogs and doves. Isn't that the main reason the media does it? To have an understanding of such a complicated matter like monetary policy. That's true, but simplification always, it has its advantages in terms of sort of explainability, but you also tend to lose a lot of nuance. And I can assure you that then when we debate sort of the inflation and growth outlook in the, in the council uh, uh, every so many weeks, that there are a lot of nuances that are brought into, uh, into the discussion. And actually, I would tend to say that the council as a whole has a dovish leaning now yeah. <laughs> because we still have uh, an environment of relatively low inflation. So, well. Well, uh, all large central banks, the ECB, the Fed, the BOJ, they all seem to target 2% or close to 2% as the, as the ECB does. Uh, the ECB, of course, explicitly targets just below 2%. What makes 2% this holy number everyone seems to strive for? Well, 2% uh, uh, is, of course, a number. Um, the idea behind the number is that 0% inflation is actually deflation, or at least negative inflation, and that's because the, the me our measurement of inflation doesn't take into account a couple of factors like quality improvements, uh, basket substitution, uh, that you sort of as a consumer tends to switch from, uh, from more expensive to cheaper goods. All these factors that do play a role in normal life are not uh, well incorporated in the way statisticians measure inflation. Mm -hmm. And what we target, of course, is the measure that statisticians produce on inflation. And that's why it is widely believed that the positive inflation number actually uh, confirms with price stability and that zero inflation is not price stability. Now, how large these factors are, I think the, the sort of the most recent estima estimate that I am aware of is the, the so-called Boskin uh, report in the, in the US. And I think it estimates these factors to be roughly on the order of magnitude of 1%. Mm -hmm. And then there is the question, which you, why not target 1%? Well, because you do want to have a buffer over and above 1%, 
because once you start hitting the zero lower bound, eh, there are some asymmetric issues with monetary policy which makes it more difficult to ease than to tighten at some point, and that's why it's better to also have a small buffer over and above that 1%, and that's why eh, most central banks have an objective where the 2% is, uh, is part of. So what would be the economic uh, consequences of 3% inflation? Would it be catastrophic then? Is there empirical <laughs> evidence then that 2% is that important? Well, you know, I mean, of course, taken at face value, 3% inflation is not catastrophic. Yeah. But who can assure you that once you allow for 3, that then somebody will tell you, well, now that inflation is 3%, 4% inflation is not really catastrophic, is it, right? So where does the it end? So what is, is important for us is that inflation expectations are well anchored and that that anchor is stable. And that's why we continue to emphasize eh, the below but close to 2% as sort of the anchor. You can, of course, have t temporary deviations from uh, that anchor because we don't control inflation, Understand. right? We yeah. control interest rates. We have a fair degree of control over financial conditions in the broader sense, but we don't control growth. We don't control inflation. So it's invariably in an economy that is continuously hit by all kinds of shocks that you have sort of variability around the target and, and that's why inflation will never be precisely 2% in, in a straight line. Yeah. But it is important that inflation expectations are well anchored, that those doing wage negotiations, etc., eh, in the long run or in the medium term, I should say, eh, that they count on us delivering sort of roughly that, that kind of inflation. So you do also control other aspects of yeah. the financial And market. if I may come back to why not 3%, well, History has taught that as soon as inflation sort of overshoots 2%, then you get all kinds of nasty sort of automatic indexation mechanisms that sort of creep into an economy okay. so that the higher than 2% inflation becomes embedded and is much, much more difficult to get rid of. Yeah? Automatic wage indexation, I think we got rid of it in the Netherlands somewhere in the 1980s, which was a good thing, but I would not want that to come back. Yeah. And the longer inflation sort of exceeds 2%, the higher the likelihood that calls for these kinds of nominal rigidities uh, will come back into an economy, yeah, which will reduce flexibility and ultimately reduce uh, productivity growth, uh, etc. So indeed, the ECB focuses a lot on uh, inflation. Uh, many other central banks also target uh, different aspects of the economy. For example, the Fed focuses on <coughs> unemployment or employment. Um, why is the ECB reluctant in focusing uh, on more uh, on other aspects of inflation? Well, also this is not an, uh, a black and white uh, differentiation between the Fed and the ECB. The ECB targets inflation because it believes that it is much clearer to have a single target on which it can be accountable. But of course, in the ECB's thinking, the Phillips curve plays an important role, which means that in order to get inflation where we are, we look very closely on capacity utilization. When you look at capacity utilization, implicitly you look at economic growth, economic growth relative to potential growth. So implicitly, the ECB also looks at growth because, for instance, in the current context, yeah, making sure that there is sufficient capacity utilization, sufficient growth, is ultimately providing us with the confidence that inflation will return to levels below but close to 2% over the medium term. But uh, so uh, the ECB has this uh, belief that if we keep inflation at 2%, economic growth will follow. No, no, no. It, it, it believes in the, uh, what I'm trying to say, that in the current context where current inflation is more around 1% than around 2%, mm -hmm. that what the ECB tries to do is to put the conditions in place that growth continues to outpace potential growth, which means that cap capacity utilization will increase, that in the economy, we'll, we will create scarcity, scarcity on the labor market, scarcity on goods markets, etc. And that will then ultimately push up prices because that's a, a basic law of economics that when, when something becomes scarce, the price will go up. So growth and activity is an interim target toward the ultimate target of, of, uh, of price stability. Okay, um, now let's move on to the euro, which is the currency that the ECB controls. The euro is a very unique currency. It yeah. overreaches uh, many different countries with different institutional <coughs> qualities and therefore different productivity levels. Why would countries like the Netherlands and Germany, 
countries with good institutions and good produ and well, high productivity, why would they be motivated to join the euro? <coughs> well, my God, that's a question <laughs> that, of course, yeah, was relevant in the 1990s when we took the decision to go to the euro. Uh, what I would say is that if you look at other monetary unions like the United States, there are also huge differences in GDP per capita, in productivity levels across regions. That is not necessarily an impediment or an obstacle to creating a monetary union, as long as, of course, nominal wage growth is a fair reflection of these differentials in productivity growth. Of course, it would be easier for a monetary union to have more sort of convergence of uh, income levels, uh, living standards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But even in the US, you have Kentucky versus California, uh, which are quite different in terms of. But would of you say the institutional, in the institutional level, would you say that they're as different? For example, between Greece. No, and no, no. The, 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 the main difference, Germany. of course, is that the US is a political union and a fiscal union. That's the difference. But in and of itself, productivity differentials can coexist with the monetary union as long as they are properly reflected in wage levels and thereby in competitive uh, positions. Okay, so um, Joseph Stiglitz uh, argued that uh, the European project is too important to be destroyed by the euro. <laughs> well, uh, pretty extreme quote. Why do people have this, this image uh, that the euro has the potential to destroy the European uh, project? Well, because I think that too often uh, the problems of the euro are mixed up with sort of the policy mistakes that are made at domestic level. So too often the euro is blamed for all kinds of economic problems, economic disruptions Which in Europe. Which type of decisions are you talking about? With where at the heart of these decisions it is bad policy making at the national level. Uh, overspending, uh, overborrowing. Overspending, allowing uh, sort of wage levels to get out of hand. Uh, I mean, uh, let's look at uh, the 2001 to 2008. Wage levels in Greece rose 40%, 4-0, more than in Germany. There was absolutely no indication in those years that productivity growth in Greece also exceeded productivity growth in Germany by 40%. On the contrary, that you, can blame, you cannot blame the euro for that. I mean, if a country becomes so uncompetitive because of domestic wage arrangements, well, so I'm sorry, but, but... Doesn't the euro give the incentives for these countries? I mean, countries from Italy, Greece usually, they have bad institutions and therefore, historically speaking, they often overspend and overborrow. And the euro gave them the financial credibility to uh, get that credit. Isn't that, isn't that, didn't the euro then create like corrosive incentives for them to do this? Well, the one thing that the euro did to these countries was of course that it massively lowered borrowing costs. Yes. Right. And when you have a, a huge decline in borrowing costs, there is always the risk of over borrowing uh, and, and building up uh, real estate imbalances, etc. And yes, unfortunately, that has happened. Uh, and as um, well as at the same time, it would have given also a huge opportunity to reform their economies, the supply side of the economies. That has only happened because of the crisis, and in that sense, yes, there is a lot to sort of regret. But even without the crisis, mm. institutions don't, be, don't just get reformed in, in a few days. It takes years to be reformed. It takes years to be, that's true. But if you look at what has happened in uh, Ireland, Spain, and Portugal because of the crisis, I, I think there has been a thorough uh, structural adjustment program, and it's not for nothing that these three countries are now among the fastest growing ones. So it can be done, it can, it be, can done. be done. But it is, with reforms, you have to continue years and years and years, and you know that the rewards will only arrive two, three to five years after you started. So it's a long-term trajectory. But look at the Netherlands in the 1980s. I would dare to say that if you look at the Dutch economy in the 1980s, we were at the same terrible position than many of the peripheral countries in 2008, 2009, and also in the Netherlands. We've had a reform trajectory which lasted until well in the 1990s, so which spent more than a decade uh, to get us sort of out, of out of the difficult situation. Mm -hmm. And that is what it is with reforms. Of course, but another aspect of the economy that, uh, of the currency that is the peripheral countries gave up is the ability to devalue the currency, which is a very yep. important tool countries with bad institutions often do to remain productive. 
Yeah. Whereas well, the countries in the core, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, they benefited from a euro that is lower than their actual value. But there, what did these peripheral countries gain in return of uh, this cost? Well, uh, what you're highlighting at, again, is an internal discussion that actually you should have asked the policy, you should not ask me, you should ask the policymakers in those questions. It is true. If you give up your exchange rate as an external sort of mechanism for adjustment, you can only do so if you're quite sure that you have your internal sort of alternative mechanisms of adjustment. And that means that you need a lot more internal uh, uh, price and wage uh, flexibility. Whether that debate has been sufficiently conducted in these countries before turning into the uh, before joining the euro, that's a fair question. But that's a fair question you should ask in the policy to the policymakers in these uh, in these countries. They should have been aware that it has a price giving up uh, a mechanism of adjustment. Uh, but that's not something you can blame the European Central Bank for. I think the European no, Central no, Bank no. has <laughs> been crystal clear on this. Uh, I think it, the reason we ask it is because it's. It's a common theme in yeah. recent political discussions of core countries and politicians in core countries saying that uh, it is all because of them, that their good finances, that they are in a good state economically. But that ignores the fact that the countries in the peripheral, they gave up a lot, right? They gave up the mechanism uh, of adjusting their exchange rate, right? Which if you look cost the Which northern countries yeah, in if you terms look of prices. back in history from 1970 to let's say 1998 so the last three decades before economic and monetary union it was well known that unit labor cost in countries like netherlands germany austria went up by a factor two and a half in france it went up by a factor like eight uh, in uh, italy spain portugal 15 in greece it went up with a factor of 35 or so well it was well known that if these countries join the monetary union, that you cannot continue to have these huge differences in unit labor cost. But that's yeah. something that needs to be sort of explained and told and decided and established at the national level. Um, and what has come into play here is, of course, that economic and monetary union and the euro was never solely uh, an economic project. Had it been an economic project, then, of course, this question would have been why, why on earth do you join eh, if you cannot deliver on that kind of internal adjustment mechanisms. Yeah. But the euro has also always been a political project and that's where things become a little bit messy if you take, eh, uh, take decisions for political motives without thinking through sufficiently the economic consequences, then there is a cost involved. Okay, so at this point, the eurozone reforms are actually focusing on controlling their deficits, controlling the deficits of uh, but don't you think this this focus should shift towards more solidarity from uh, the Netherlands and, and Germany, given these this this problem? Well, the ne the, as you indicated, the Netherlands and Germany have profited significantly from the euro uh, because uh, the euro is clearly, as a currency, is has been less strong. It has not been weak, but it has been less strong than sort of the Deutschmark would have been yeah. Yeah, had the yeah. Deutschmark still reflected the strength of the, the German economy, etc. So, you, so in that sense, yes, we profited. And it's a fair question on whether these sort of benefits are equally well uh, distributed, etc. And on whether you would have some other solidarity mechanisms to redistribute some of these, uh, some of these gains. Um, but at the end of the day, that's a political question. It also has to do with sort of with whom do you feel solidarity, right? Of course. Um, and within a country, there is solidarity. People from the north and the south feel solidarity. But we've seen, in the, particularly in the Greek crisis, that solidarity in some of the northern yeah. European countries was rather thin. If but you I mean, saw, if you read the newspapers, etc., huh? uh, um, back and forth. So we don't have that deep, deep degree of solidarity at the European level yet. As we, where we do have it in the Netherlands, for instance, between uh, the north and the south and the west and the east of the country. And that's something that can only grow over time. And it's up for politicians to decide how much sort of solidarity they want to accept and to what extent they are ready to, uh, well, to, to, to spend money outside the country, essentially. Grow, grow over time or have the ne necessary institutional framework from the start. 
or a bit transfer well, in case of a, of again, a crisis. Again, you're going with your questions. Actually, you're going back to the 1990s. Of course. And there was a debate on whether you should first have the convergence and only then go to monetary union. Yeah. Or, and that was the more the political view, set a date, go to monetary union, and be confident that the convergence will follow. So would you well, say... Well, the second school of thought was the one that prevailed with hindsight. I say <laughs> it would have been better if the first school of thought would have be prevailed. But so okay, we can't change history. Would you Perfect. say that then the politicians at the time were blinded by this political idealism that you know, made them ignore the economic uh, They did not pay uh, sufficient amount of attention uh, to the economic risks that were involved. Of course, nobody at the time could predict that there would be a global financial crisis eh, that, like the one that we have lived through. But yes, there could have been a little bit more attention uh, for the economic risks. And actually, there were some, there were economists making these kinds of warnings, but they were largely ignored. Or and American. actually, from within the central banking circles, there were these warnings, because I was in the Netherlands Bank already at the time, and we were fiercely opposed to setting an end date eh, without sort of being assured that there would be uh, a, a sufficient amount yeah. of convergence. But at the political level, it was decided that the end date model would be the model. And then, as a central bank technocrat, you have to accept that that is sort of the political decision. <laughs> to live with it. Well, I think it's yeah. now a good time to move on to the audience and see if there's any questions. Please keep in mind that we will discuss uh, the reforms that are necessary to save the euro and uh, the quantitative easing program. So is there anyone that would like to ask a question? Uh, yes, over there. My question is about the uh, derivative uh, contracts. Uh, it has been said that Italy, the Italian Republic, uh, could get into the Eurozone, meeting the ECB criteria. Which Republic? Italian Republic. Italian? Yes. Yeah. They, they got into the Eurozone, uh, despite the fact that they didn't have the criteria to meet uh, this criteria. And it has been said that this, uh, this is due to uh, the signing of derivative contracts with other banks. At the moment, uh, Italy pays something like between 4 billion to 7 billion euros per year uh, on derivative contracts. My question is about, are there derivative contracts of uh, Dutch banks with Italy, with the Italian treasury at the moment? Well, there's a lot in your question, but I, I guess that I think you suggest a degree of relations that I, I do not recognize as such. Let, let's go back to the Italian entry into economic and monetary union first. It was clear that Italy was not meeting the debt criterion in the stricted sense, eh, that public debt was not below 60%. But then again, that criterion was relaxed somewhere in 1995, four years before sort of the euro uh, came about. Initially, in 1991, this had been the criterion that you needed to meet. But then halfway, the 1990s, it became clear <laughs> that almost no membership, <laughs> no country would have met that criteria, not the Netherlands, not Germany. It would have been essentially probably a monetary union between Luxembourg and Estonia or something like that. Um, and then sort of at one of the European summits, the decision was taken that the 60% should not be interpreted literally, but as long as there was a sufficiently convincing movement toward 60%, so that the debt level was coming down in the direction of 60%, that that was enough to also meet that criterion. And well, the rest is history. Uh, all the countries could join, including Italy, but also the Netherlands, who was not meeting that uh, fiscal criterion at this moment. Let me also say on Italy one word. I mean, there's a lot that one can say on the supply side of the Italian economy, the banking sector, etc. Italy has a very high public debt, but Italy has conducted a relatively responsible fiscal policy throughout the crisis. So the problems in the Italian public finances are legacy problems that de predate the euro, uh, high level of debt, which is not coming down, which is not coming down, etc. But Italy is not a story of fiscal profligacy. I think that is a pre prejudice that sometimes exists in the Netherlands, and that's why I insist to, uh, on, this, on this point. Um, and actually, in most countries, 
during the crisis, sort of the fiscal, uh, the public finances getting out of hand was a consequence of the crisis, was not a cause of, of the course. crisis. The cause yeah. of the crisis was loss of competitiveness and the building up of unsustainable bubbles in the real estate, in the non-tradable sector in, uh, in many of the uh, peripheral countries and a little bit also again in the Netherlands, but okay, I won't dwell on that too long. <laughs> um, so now, the derivatives, I'm not sure. I mean, treasuries use derivatives, but they use derivatives to sort of smooth the interest rate profile and the maturity profile of their debt. That's a perfectly rational uh, undertaking. I think also the Dutch treasury will use those derivatives. And of course, it's the banks that provide those derivatives. As long as these are done at an arm's length uh, mechanism, there's actually nothing wrong. It, it, it more or less stabilizes the interest pattern that, that, a, that a country has to pay. So derivatives have, have a negative connotation, but that depends, it, it entirely depends on sort of what is the purpose for the derivatives. In Greece, derivatives have been used to conceal the level of debt. That's a different story. I'm not aware of any such sort of eh, try effort to conceal the level of public debt. In Italy. Al also is true in Italy. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid you're sort of uh, relating a couple of issues that are actually not, uh, not related. And to the extent that Dutch banks are uh, engaged, well, undoubtedly so, like any other bank, but it's not that I have any sort of specific observation on that. So after the, um, as a result of the, the prolonged crisis, um, uh, the ECB has implemented the Q uh, QE, and you uh, have publicly opposed uh, this recently, and you said that it must end as soon as possible. Why do you think it must end as soon as possible? Well, first, also here, to take away uh, a sort of an impression that I wouldn't want to uh, continue to exist, I've supported 95, 98, perhaps 99 percent of all sort of crisis-related measures Policies. that the yeah, ECB okay. has taken, right? Including QE. Lo uh, that's the only <laughs> one that I was <laughs> coming to. Lowering rates into negative territory, extending uh, targeted longer-term refinancing operations uh, to the banks, the whatever it takes the in whatever. 2012 and yeah. the outright monetary transactions that it was subsequently uh, translated mm -hmm. into, uh, where the ECB assumed a sort of lender of last resort function uh, where redenomination risk was taken out of the equation, where it didn't pay for market participants anymore to speculate on, on a forced euro exit. All these measures I have supported. And these measures, in my view, were effective. They were effective so that if you look at the growth pattern, for instance, in 2014, growth resumed in 2013 and growth accelerated to a level clearly exceeding potential growth since the third quarter of 2014. What about deflation back then? Inflation was low, around zero, but that was almost entirely due to a decline in oil prices. And what central bankers generally do is try to look through temporary factors and focus on underlying inflation. And the decline in underlying inflation was much, much milder and never came any place near to negative territory so the fact that headline inflation was minus 0 0.1 or 2 for a few months was entirely due to the collapse of oil prices. And central bankers should not respond to uh, movements in volatile components like oil prices, mm -hmm. only to the extent that there are second order effects into core in, into wage setting behavior, into core inflation, etc. Those factors were not visible at that time. Growth was accelerating. So I, at that moment, was of the opinion that we've done enough. The intended results are there. Let's now sort of uh, let growth sort of take off, let growth continue its path. Then we will get more and more capacity utilization. And at the end of the road, inflation. we will also get inflation. Okay. Now, all those in the council thought that this was too benign and thought that the ECB still needed to do more over and above all this long list. And I have not even mentioned the full list yeah, of, of things that we had already uh, done before. That was the debate. It's up for historians to decide whether there was any deflation risk in 2015. I continue to challenge that, but so okay. So you would not decide. change your vote? As of today, as of today, I think everybody agrees that deflation risk is nowhere near, uh, it's clear beyond the horizon. 
growth is, has been exceeding potential ever since this third quarter of 2014. So for almost four years in a row now, we have gr had growth exceeding potential. So I'm even more confident today that we put the conditions in place for a sustainable return of inflation rates to below but close to 2%. And that's why I don't think we need this extraordinary asset purchase program anymore. And by the way, even if you believed in the asset purchase program in 2015, the stock of assets that we now have on our balance sheet is so large that there's already enough monetary accommodation sort of emerging from the stock. We don't need to add 30 billion a month anymore. The free float of bonds is so low, the stock is so large that even, even internal ECB estimates have a very, very minor effect of this last sort of 30 billion a month on, on, on the inflation outlook. It's on the order of magnitude of 0.1, 0.2%. It's simply not worth it. And that's why I believe that after September, because we committed to September, after September, we, we should, should find the way to the exit as soon as possible. Yeah. So you still think that in 2015, there was no risk for deflation? Essentially, just to be clear, well, you I wouldn't change your vote if you I could vote back, back in time. I mean, uh, I'm not going into hi hypothetical arguments hypothetical. here. Let, let historians, historians decide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in, in an interview with FD last week, uh, you claim that the ECB is keeping inefficient companies alive with, I mean, all these measures that you're talking about. Could you extend this claim to countries as well? Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, uh, again, taking a step back, also in the context of the previous discussion, whenever you think about taking a measure or not, you have a sort of triangulation. Is it necessary? Is it effective? And what are the, si the negative side effects? Because any public policy intervention has negative side effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, on the asset purchase program, again, I was not convinced, all that convinced that it was still necessary. Since we have a much more bank-based financial system in Europe than in the US, I was also not convinced that sort of eh, taking this US instrument, QE, to Europe would have, would have been as effective in Europe as it had been in the US. Even in the US, by the way, there is some debate on the effectiveness of QE. Um, and the third, of course, argument that came into play, which is where you were referring to, is that this is such an unconventional policy that takes us in such uncharted territory that there are likely to be serious side effects. It is a very, very deep intervention by the, by the central bank into what is normally left to market forces, what is normally left to market functioning. Normally, the central bank only controls the short rate, sort of the path of future short rates, long-term interest rates, the whole yield curve is left to market forces. Nowadays, the central bank controls the whole yield curve. It's not only the expected path of future interest rates that is sort of tried to control by forward guidance. Then we have QE that is try, try, tries to control the term premium. There's almost nothing left for market forces. And if you disallow market forces to do their work, invariably you will get misallocation, you will get zombification, and that you will pay a price for that in the long term in terms of lower productivity growth lower increases of living standards, and, and I think we should take that into account as but well. So you don't think that uh, the APP program by the ECB helped, uh, well, maintained yields for, for example, Italy? No, no, lower. no, it helped a lot. Right? I mean, uh, no, 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 I'm not saying that it was ineffective, eh, by yeah. the way. I am, I'm just saying you need to look at necessity, effectiveness, and side effects. side effects. side effect, exactly. Of course, there is some effect. If you if you buy two and a half trillion of assets, come on, of but course, you would yeah. that is them as an good. effect. If you look at what the, the program has, has uh, achieved, it has eased financial conditions up to a point where borrowing costs are not an impediment to any spending decisions anymore. It has reduced financial fragmentation. That is, I think, where you yeah. refer to eh, by bringing down borrowing costs, particularly also of the peripheral the borrowers. Peripheral That's an absolute pro. It has... I would say kept up growth. I don't think it has generated growth yeah, because yeah. the growth, in my view, was already there. Uh, but it has clearly yeah, uh, helped uh, growth to continue, even in, 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 in the sign of a few adverse shocks that still hit the euro area, area economy uh, during those years. And deflation risk is now clearly behind yeah. the horizon. And also the program has helped in that realization. So yes, there are absolutely some positive effects of the program as well. 
And that's why I can't answer the question, what would you do if again? Okay. Uh, because it's very hard to say. You have to weigh ex ante what you think the positive effects will be, and you have to weigh them against sort of the negative side effects. And that's always a different challenge, and that's a, a situational trade-off that you have to make. And today the situation is different than it was three years ago. I know a lot more today than I knew okay. uh, back then, and that's why it's not, not so productive. In particular with how it has helped countries uh, with cost of borrowing, do you believe the countries like Italy, uh, well, Italy and Spain, do you think that they have taken the opportunity that QE has given them to fix their finances? Well, again, the main thing that brought down borrowing costs for Italy and Spain was not the QE, was the whatever it takes, whatever it takes. and the outright monetary transactions, right? Because then borrowing the 10-year interest rate was around 6 7%. And if you look at yeah, in the aftermath of the summer of 2012, borrowing costs came down spectacularly. The additional impact that QE has had, still another 100 basis points or so, but the real big effect was after uh, sort of the OMT. And again, I repeat, I supported support that fully. Yeah. I helped <laughs> crafting that program. I take full ownership, full responsibility for that program as of today. Now, the question is, does it make governments lazy uh, in terms of postponing reforms? If so, it does so everywhere in the Eurozone. So there is no need to single out single uh, Italy country. and Spain. If you look at the pace of structural reforms, it has been poor everywhere. In, and it has been disappointing everywhere in the Eurozone. Oh, Germany. Yes. Yeah. Do you there has not been a serious reform in Germany <laughs> since 2008, 2009. Do you expect these reforms to, uh, to start happening now that QE is stopping? Um, well, I, I think we should be careful with the link between monetary policy and the sort of the willingness to undertake, uh, undertake reforms. So I'm not sure whether stopping QE would uh, all of a sudden make people reform like crazy. I, I think the, the reason why reform <laughs> come about or don't uh, come about are typically entirely national. There's a lot of political reasons that go into there, the political cycle, elections, etc. So I wouldn't make that sort of generalized uh, link. It's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Is there not a, a risk now that, uh, for example, I the when the Fed ended QE... Well, let me say one thing where there is an explicit <laughs> link, if I may. Yeah, okay? yeah, go ahead. QE has ge clearly given all the governments an interest rate windfall. Yes. Because yeah. borrowing costs are lower. Yeah. What we are, and this is not just class lot, I think the, everybody in Frankfurt is disappointed about, is the fact that this windfall benefit has not been used to lower public debt. The only thing that governments would have needed to do is not spend the windfall. And even that, unfortunately, has not materialized. So the windfall has been spent etc. And that's something where I think an opportunity has been missed because uh, some public debt situation would have been less problematic today if over the last three years that sort of windfall that the ECB has created for the governments would simply not have been spent and, uh, and been used to reduce the, the public debt. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying that the, the Fed decreased, when they decreased QE, the bond yields went up for the US initially. Um, do, you, do you think that might happen also for European countries uh, with a lot of debt at this point, as they haven't decreased their debt? Um, yeah, in and of itself, directionally, I think you're right. It's going I to mean, happen. if you believe that entering in QE and doing bond purchases lowers interest rates, then by <laughs> implication, exiting uh, uh, sort of uh, has the potential of increasing interest rates again. But then my first comment would be, this is not just a flow issue. It's, I think, more a stock issue. The stock yeah. of public debt in the market ultimately yeah, decides the price uh, of borrowing. And we will have a reinvestment policy even after ending the net asset purchases later this year. We will have a reinvestment policy so that the stock of bonds on the balance sheet of the, the European system of central banks will continue to be at this high and elevated Everything. level for yeah. a few years to come. So that should significantly, I think, contain any uh, fear of interest rates uh, rising oh, yeah. again. Okay. Secondly, longer term interest rates are also determined to a large extent by global factors. We have a global 
sort of capital market there, around uh, half of the sort of uh, variability in long-term interest rates is, is typically decided by global rather than domestic factors. So it also plays a role what happens in the US, what happens in so Japan. You, but and you're elsewhere. still quite confident that there won't be greater risks regarding the interest rates? Of there will be slightly warranty. higher interest rates, but not up to the point where I believe that debt sustainability concerns uh, should resurface. No. OK. okay. Uh, in 2012, when you were here, you said that, talking about the European and Monetary Union, you said that we've made some progress in, back in 2012 on the monetary side with a common currency, but we still lag behind on the economic yep. part. Six years after that interview, do you think that politicians have done anything to move uh, into further integration? Well, uh, there has been some progress, but I think it has been slow. Um, well, the, the European stability mechanism was not there six years ago, which I think In is times of crisis, it was... In times of crisis, it was created. It was overdue. It needed to be <laughs> created, but it was created. Uh, the ECB has taken uh, its outright monetary transactions, also an implicit sort of stabilization role in the European context, which was not there six years ago, which is now uh, there. But of course, it is not enough. Not enough. No. And again, what helps if you first look at successful federations, successful monetary union, where do you see more integration? I look at the US. You have private risk sharing, you have public risk sharing. What is particularly lacking in Europe is a sufficient degree of private risk sharing. In the US, private risk sharing is five or six times as important as public risk sharing through the federal budget in yeah. terms of stabilizing sort of shocks across states in the uh, United States. What is private risk sharing? That means a banking union. Yeah. It means yeah. a capital markets uh, union. Now, on the banking union in Europe, yes, there has been progress. There was no banking union in 2012. There is a banking union today. It has not yet been completed. Yes. We're still lacking uh, a European deposit insurance scheme, but I'm comf uh, comf uh, confident that this European deposit insurance scheme ultimately will arrive. And yeah. actually, uh, there, there, is, there is discussions ongoing on this subject. On the capital markets union, the European Commission is taking various initiatives. It is difficult material but it needs to happen because it needs to happen because that is one of the reasons why i think uh, the us yeah. is more successful relatively <laughs> because they have a better developed and a deeper capital market which sort of smoothes shocks across yeah. the whole region and which which yeah is a form of insurance yeah so in the next three years will arguably make or break the the euro the policies put into place the reforms put into place if you were part of the discussion which to uh, to a large extent you are um, what policy would you t put on top of the agenda? Well, first of all, I don't like too much this continuous talk about make or break. I, I think <laughs> it is a sort of sense of crisis. We okay. have to accept well, it's not that a crisis, the euro is a different currency because uh, we have to live in a different institutional environment and we have to work with small steps gradually to improve that institutional environment. What step but I, I don't like the fact of having this continuous crisis uh, sense. I think we should leave the crisis behind us. Okay. There are uh, shortcomings, and we need to work on those uh, shortcomings. And the most important aspect for me would be to get the capital markets union. That is something which, unfortunately, doesn't attract an awful lot of political attention because it's very technical, it's yeah. a little bit under the hood. Yeah, uh, but it is very, very important. The simple fact that if a state in the US like California <laughs> enjoys a, uh, a recession, of course, profitability in the companies in that state goes down. Yeah. And then these losses are immediately dispersed over shareholders that are dispersed over the whole United States, not just in California. So the losses are immediately sort of shared across the whole region. We don't have that kind of me mechanism to a sufficient extent in Europe, and that's where we need to build on. Okay, so um, so that's collectivized debt. Yeah. So um, collectivized debt would actually um, be a big gain for fiscal sinners over the past few uh, few decades. Um, why would the Netherlands... Be careful with mingling economics with morality, okay? <laughs> uh, no, what enough, do you mean by a fiscal sinner? But why, why would the Netherlands uh, accept such a policy? Why would, would they accept it? Well, I mean, because the Netherlands gains uh, significantly from being part of the Eurozone because it provides okay. us access to markets that would otherwise have been closed. 
to but our export they, products. Are they closed at uh, accepting this? I, I'm, I, no, I, 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 I the European market is relatively open. And in the Eurozone, there is no exchange rate risk if you want to export your products and services across the Euro area. I have absolutely no doubt if we didn't have the Euro, you would have competitive devaluations, which would have made it much, much more difficult for Dutch exporters yeah. to tap these uh, markets in the rest of the Euro area. So there is no doubt that the Netherlands yeah. profits significantly from being part of the European Union and being part of the Euro area. So how do we convince our politicians of that? Well, I, uh, I by continuing to <laughs> repeat the message, <laughs> I guess. No, but I okay. think there is, uh, to be fair, I think there is more or less, uh, at agreement. least among the mainstream parties, there is consensus. Uh, after the Brexit, there was a short period in which some people said, oh, the Netherlands shouldn't we rethink. But I think very quickly from left to right, even the more Eurosceptic parties were saying, no, eh, membership of the Euro and membership of the EU is not at stake here. We have to work to make the EU and the Euro area function yeah. better. And that's why we have to take more steps toward integration. I would say private integration more than public integration, but even public integration, we've made steps through the ESM, yes. et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, the European Monetary Fund seems like a very uh, plausible re reform that's going to happen. Um, do you think that politicians see it as a replacement for a euro bond or collectivized debt? Um, I would not say that it is a, an alternative to a euro bond. Of course, the ESM also issues debt, uh, yeah. which uh, is, of course, debt of all its uh, shareholders. But the ESM is confined to uh, crisis management finance whenever there is yeah. an adjustment program. Yeah, of and a country has lost access to, uh, to the markets, whereas a euro bond, of course, would uh, also be there in normal times to finance normal spending, even huh, for countries that would, would still have uh, market access. So there is a significant difference. It, it is part of the crisis management infrastructure that needs to be there. It needs to be there in a single country. It needs to be there and in the, the monetary the union. And the EMF would replace the ESM. But what, are, what would be exactly the main differences between the two? Uh, well, in my view, the differences would not have be to be much. so large. I yeah. think the ESM uh, uh, has functioned uh, relatively well. Uh, you could expand it a little bit, give it a bit more, um, let's say, competences in the area of continuous surveillance, as also yeah. the IMF has uh, yeah, on a global scale. Uh, you could think about sort of ways to do continuous debt sustainability analysis so that it makes it more easy that if a country arrives into trouble, that you actually do a debt restructuring up front before uh, providing conditional financing, uh, because I think that's the, 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 the right sequence to do things. So uh, it has to improve its, 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 uh, its functioning in those two areas, but I think in and of itself, the infrastructure is there that can be built upon. But this is more of the prevention side of the EMF, but yep. when, we talk about, okay, a crisis, a crisis has hit. Uh, how would the EMF solve the problems the ESM has, which is mainly, you know, this institution being seen, foreign institution being seen, going into a foreign country and reforming countries and not truly, like, we, we talk about solidarity. The, the, yeah, but solidarity can never be free money. Of course. But there, no, there need to be conditionality be attached. Because when a country needs money, it is because things have gone sour in the country, right? Then, of course, they need the financing because otherwise eh, you, you would look into a, a sort of a, an economic drama in that country. But that financing should, should always come with conditions and these conditions should be aimed at taking away the underlying cause of why the country arrived into trouble in the first place. That's also the, the way the IMF works. That's the, the mechanism. But the IMF has problems level. with that as well. The IMF is not seen in a great light in many countries. Well, because nobody exactly has ever problems. seen in a great light that comes into a country and has to tell the politicians ah, what well, they you have did to the do. wrong thing. You have to change your policy. But well, it's a hell of a job, but somebody needs <laughs> to do it. I mean, uh, OK. So um, the US has automatic stabilizing mechanisms uh, when we're talking yeah. about uh, prevention. 
um, so they have uh, social welfare, food stamps, and unemployment insurance. Should these stabilizing mechanisms be implemented in Europe? To are they necessary to stabilize the euro? I think in general, uh, automatic stabilizers should be present. Um, but at this moment, we have the mechanism of automatic stabilizers embedded in the stability and growth pact, okay. which prescribes that at sort of peak cycle times, like the current, that national budgets should be close to balance or in surplus. That would create three percentage points of GDP space for automatic stabilizers to run in each if a country okay. yeah, yeah. goes into a recession. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are very few member states that take this sort of medium term objective seriously. In the Netherlands, we do. In Germany, at this moment, they do. Uh, and there are a few more countries. But as long as that willingness is not there to sort of enforce these automatic stabilizers at the national level, it's a little bit of a wild jump to assume that you could create this, this mechanism at the Euro European level, because ultimately that space has to be provided by taxpayers. If taxpayers yeah. are unwilling to pay taxes to provide that space at the national level, what makes you so optimistic that they would be willing to pay the taxes to create that space at the European level? That, that's a sort of institutional question that I, ha that I haven't found a satisfactory answer yeah. to yet. Uh, I think it's time for an audience question. Uh, the woman sitting uh, no, on the left. Okay, thank you. Well, um, about um, I would like to point out some actual issues. Uh, for instance, we are I'm from the um, foundation Our Money on Scheld, like positive money. And I'm especially from the working group Financial Education, and I think that is a real shortage, shortage uh, in uh, education in schools and universities. Yeah. But besides that, uh, we are waiting for the rep advisory uh, report from the Scientific Council for the Government about money creation. And um, I'd like to know, um, um, I'd like to ask your uh, opinion about that. And in, in that uh, light about the distinction between private and public banking, uh, for instance, now in, 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 the, in the US there are the in initiatives like that about public C banking. Could you keep it concise? Yeah, <laughs> and then um, I would like to know about your opinion about the Swiss Volgeld. What Volgeld? The Swiss what? Volgeld initiative. Yeah. Could you formulate okay. it into one question and then... Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I think and you I know what you're getting at, but okay. uh, yeah. Now, can I put, you are still all uh, uh, talking about growth and we know we can go on with growth and uh, in the um, budget from the uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs, they are talking now la, uh, about circular economy and to pricing and uh, what's your opinion about that? Yeah. Thank you. What's your opinion about circular growth? Um, well, I think uh, the opinion was on a lot of stuff. First, on, on financial education, we are strong, strong supporters of that. We think it's very important to teach particularly young kids at a very early age about uh, financial products and financial awareness. We also need to teach, I think, the financial institutions that offer these products, that they offer them in a way uh, that can be understood by the customers. Second point, on fractional reserve banking, because that was where you were actually referring to when talking who needs to do the credit creation, who needs to do the money creation in the economy. Um, well, I, I think there is little alternative to the current model. I don't believe in these sort of full reserve banking sectors where the government needs to be responsible for sort of all credit and money origination in an economy. Again, I, I still have more confidence in market forces arriving at a sort of optimal allocation of uh, scarce resources. Even if market forces make huge mistakes, let there be no doubt about it, the crisis of 2008-2009, eh, if the market if le is left unfettered, it sometimes gets out of hand and gets at the wrong track. Nonetheless, alternative systems are a little bit like the Soviet Union between 1917 and 1989. Yeah, where sort of the, the public sector takes over all these uh, allocative roles. And I don't think that the public sector over a longer period of time 
even despite all the crisis that capitalism goes through every now and then, that the public sector does a better job than the private sector, and that's also true for credit creation, credit origination, uh, uh, risk assessment, credit risk assessment, uh, etc. So, uh, in that sense, we have to increase our supervision, we have to make sure, and that's actually what we did after the financial crisis, increase capital requirements, make sure that the banks are much, much safer, make sure that when they fail, they have more loss absorption capacity on their own balance sheet rather than have to resort to the public purse and to the taxpayer. Uh, that is where I believe in, but the essential function that credit origination is done by the banks, I don't think that there is a, there is a credible alternative. So back, uh, talking about possible crashes in capitalism, if one of those a crisis occurs in the next years, given that interest rates are so low as they are currently, what could the EC how would the ECB respond? Um, how could they, well, that's basically? a hypothetical question again, course, because I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not predicting uh, any crisis, and I wouldn't want to do so. Central banks have been very creative, very innovative over the last few years. Yeah. If such a thing occurs, you can count on us being innovative, being creative again. Quantitative easing. But at the same time, it would help if, of course, we now use these sort of very, very favorable cyclical conditions to withdraw some of the stimulus in a timely fashion, which would then create also some room for maneuver again when the next recession happens, that yeah. we would have some room to lower interest rates or use our balance sheet, uh, uh, etc. Yeah. And again, as I said, since we have still have a bank-based financial system, I would have a higher faith in sort of unconventional instruments that take the banking system as a point of entry than unconventional instruments that take the, the markets, uh, uh, sovereign bonds or whatever, so, as a point of entry. But that's a matter of sort of taste and yeah. also that would have to be assessed at that specific moment Absolutely. in time what the specific crisis would be, what the specific situation would be. But the ECB would be. would be able to combat it. And the ECB is always yeah. able to find instruments if needed. So if politicians are not able to put in reforms um, at all or eventually, uh, should the ECB keep the, the euro alive through uh, its own policies? Even Every though? single time. Well, the ECB should carry out its mandate, and its mandate is to deliver price stability. And ultimately, uh, it's a political decision on whether or not a member state chooses to be part of the eurozone. I think this is not a discussion. This, it should yeah. not be a discussion. But ultimately, it's up for the politicians. <laughs> I will strongly advise them never to make this a discussion, uh, clearly not in uh, the Netherlands. Ultimately, it's up for politicians. We, the best we can do is deliver on price stability, and that will sort of build trust and, and continue to sort of sustain trust in the euro as a sound currency internally as well as externally. Okay. okay. So... Uh, to end the interview, uh, many central bankers like Mario Draghi have discussed their motivations. And you just mentioned your mandate, but Mario Draghi and other central bankers have discussed their motivation towards the euro, uh, towards the European project that goes beyond their mandate. And I was wondering whether you have a similar motivation, something that makes you go to work every single day that is not necessarily the price stability mandate. Um, well, I, of course, I mean, uh, what motivates me is the sort of the, the public side of things, that I feel more sort of attracted to uh, public policy objectives than I do toward private sector obje uh, objectives. I believe eh, that monetary st stability contributes to the creation of sustainable prosperity. That's, by the way, also in our mission statement, and that's there of not course. for nothing. Yeah. So that is what motivates me, I think. And that peace and, and that the prosperity the then contributes also to peace. And a Europe. greater motivation towards the European project. Oh, yeah. I, I think Europe is a goal in and of itself. And, uh, and I think it's much, much better to have bureaucratic arguments at the Brussels table than to have our armies uh, clash Five with each other again. Okay. Yeah, because that's where sort of this whole process uh, started from. Yeah. And with all its shortcomings in Europe, and I, I mean, I can also mention a lot of them, but I think it's still still much better than the situation that we've had in the 20th century where yeah, our, our, our countries went to war twice with a devastating effect, yeah. uh, et cetera. 
Okay, well, thank you very much for coming here at Room for Discussion. Uh, and thank you to all our guests as well. Um, on April 13, we're going to have a session uh, on water and the Netherlands. So please uh, keep that in mind and come. Thank you very much. Thanks, lots. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.